Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm so excited once again. You know, we are able to, to gather here yeah, to praise and to worship God. Let's be ready. I would like to invite Pastor to open with a prayer. Come, let's pray together, church. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come and give our hearts to you and worship you. Father Lord, we pray for the sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit to descend on each one of us, even yes. as we are in our respective houses. Father, may there be a glorious praise and worship mm. given unto you. And so we want to commit this to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and let's praise and worship. There is a healer His love is deeper than the sea His mercy, it is unfailing His arms are a fortress for the weak Let faith Let faith arise, let 
yes lord you are faithful Amen. lord we thank you lord Yeah. 
worthy of all praise. To you our lives be raised. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome, Lord. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Amen. Hallelujah. For Thou, Lord, for Thou, Lord, for Thou, Lord, art high above all. Thank you.
Time to you, Pastor. Well, good morning, church. Thank you that you're coming again to Zoom, and we trust that you're going to enjoy this morning service as you have enjoyed the worship together. Do you realize that uh, we are now coming close to December? One whole year has just gone by. And uh, it's just like a blinking of an eye, and uh, we've had nowhere to go. We've had to stay at home. But we thank God He's been with us, He's protected us. So this morning, we're going to continue the, uh, the theme and the trend of uh, what God's been saying to us. And uh, I want to share with you about the land of the majestic king. So let's have a word of prayer first. Father, we want to commit to you this morning as we all come with open hearts to receive the word of God. May you bless us. May you make the word come alive to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Today we're talking about the land of the majestic king and Really, it is a continuation of uh, uh, last week, but with fresh new things. Huh? And as we did in the previous uh, times, we, we just want to start with uh, uh, the kingdom that cannot be shaken. So just watch with me here the scripture that I have put up here. So I want to give you another encouraging word for those of us who have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We've been encouraged in so many different uh, services as to what God has done for, is doing for us. But I want you to be encouraged with this John chapter 17, verse 9 to 20. This is the uh, prayer of Jesus for us before he went to the cross. He actually prayed for the disciples first. And he prays for them, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. That's the 12 disciples. Huh? I pray for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Isn't that a wonderful thought? We who belong to Jesus, Jesus said, he is glorified in us. So let's live uh, lives of, uh, that really will... Uh, Give honor and glory to God. I'm glorified in them. And then he says, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I'm focusing on this phrase, keep them in your, through your name. We have the power of the name of, Jesus, of God, the Father who keeps us. The first thing he says here, Jesus prayed, is that you may keep them so that they become united. They are one as we are. So unity is very important to the church because Jesus prayed for that. That the Father will keep us as one. And you will realize that it is through unity that many things is going to accomplish in the kingdom of God. And next verse, he says, while I was with them in the world, that's Jesus on earth with the disciples, he says, I kept them in your name. And those whom you gave me, I have kept. None of them is lost. Everyone except for one, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. First thing he prayed, that we be kept in unity. Second thing he prayed is that we may have the joy of God fulfilled in us. And last week's message, we said there are three things. We said declaration of faith. We said about the joy of the Holy Spirit that will enable us to go through any crime, uh, any crisis. And so Jesus prayed that his joy will be fulfilled in us. The third thing he says is that I have given them your word and the world has hated them 
because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Brothers and sisters, we are in the world. We don't belong to the world. He has given us His Word. Now, how powerful and important is the Word of God? We as a church, it's a bible storing church. We want to bring people back into the Word, not listening to what other people say about the Word, not just reading about God through other, other people's thoughts about the Word, but you going straight into the Word because Jesus says, I've given them your Word, okay? And He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. So we're not going to have a quick escape, all right? He's not going to take us out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And that's the encouraging word I want to give you this, eve this morning. That in the midst of the pandemic and whatever other shaking, Jesus prayed for us that we will be kept from the evil one. Satan will not be able to touch us because we're not of the world just as Jesus is not of the world. The next thing he says is, sanctify them for, uh, by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. All right? And uh, what is this sanctification all about? Uh, I've given you a meaning here. Sanctify means to consecrate, separate from these earthly things and earthly use and to devote or dedicate to God and His service. So, now we see what Jesus prayed for. Pray that we may be one. Pray that we may have the joy of God. Pray that his, he will be, we will be kept from the evil one. And, number, uh, and the fourth thing He said, that we will be kept serving Him always, separated from the world and serving Him always. And verse 20, which I didn't read just now, says, I don't pray for these alone, that means not just only the disciples, but also for who will believe in me through their word. So, what a wonderful thought. When Jesus was on earth, he prayed for the disciples and he prayed for them for those things. And he said, I also pray for them who are going to believe in me through your words. In other words, starting from the time the disciples, the apostles went out to preach the word, every believer after that, they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus prays for them in his prayer at John chapter 16, all right, 17, the high priestly prayer. And then Paul reminds us, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that today Jesus is still praying for us. See, he is now our high priest. The scripture says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. You see, he can sympathize with us as a high priest because he was a human being like us. He had this human nature uh, and he was tempted as we are in every aspect, but he never sinned, right? Yet he did not sin. So he understands us, therefore, when we go through the trials of life. He understands us when fears come upon us because of the pandemic, because of earthquakes, because of tsunami, or whatever other challenges that come to the uh, earth. And then he says, uh, Hebrew says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, brothers and sisters, that's why it's so important for you to learn to develop how to pray. Come to the throne of grace. You see, Jesus is the high priest waiting for us. And when we come to the throne of grace, he takes our prayers and he listens to it and he tells the Father, Lord, Father, look at your child because what is Jesus belongs to the Father as well. And what does the Father belong to Jesus? And it says, look at your child, our child, the one who has believed in me. Look, he's going through some troubles. Lord, keep him. Lord, grant, grant him grace. All right? So what a wonderful thought. Let me, be, let me encourage you that through the shaking that God's going to bring on this world, we cannot be shaken out of this world. All right? That's just an encouraging word for this, mo uh, for this uh, morning. But I want to bring you to the message proper that I want to speak about today. It's taken from is Isaiah 33, verses 7 to 14, uh, 7 to 24. It's about the land of the majestic God. And uh, here we focus on the third thing that we spoke about last week, that if we have spiritual sight, our faith 
can make us stable today. We can be unshaken if we can see the future. And then that particular verse goes on and tells us there's a land of the majestic God. And we want to see it. And there are four parts to this uh, Isaiah 33 verses 17 to 14, uh, 24, which I want you to I, I have uh, uh, broken up into for you. The first thing is, see the king. What does it mean? Second thing is, see the land. The third is, look upon Zion. And the fourth thing is, it's not by might nor by power. And I think you know the remaining of the Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. You know the remaining of that verse, all right? So, what you need to understand based on the last point of, uh, or the third point of last Sunday, where if we have spiritual faith, we stabilize our life. Spiritual sight, we stabilize our life in any crisis. Is that if we see the future, if we can see it and know it in all our hearts, like Abraham saw the city that was built by God, we can see it. And because Abraham saw, he went through all the difficulties of life and he did not ever at all give up faith. So when we see our future, we stabilize our faith. All right? And I want to just, uh, uh, because we're going to go through a lot of Isaiah, I want to vet, vet your appetite about uh, Isaiah. I've cut a little bit of uh, uh, David Paulson's uh, Unlocking the Bible uh, on the book of Isaiah. It's just about five minutes. I want to see how important for you and I to go through the book of Isaiah. Let's just watch, all right? story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. I'm going to begin with three interesting facts which are not in the Word of God. First of all, in the year 1948, a Bedouin goat herd at Qumran, just at the northern end of the Dead Sea, was just throwing stones at random and threw one into a cave on a cliff opposite him. I heard the sound of breaking clay or crockery and fled, thinking he'd uh, done some damage to some domestic property. But uh, nothing happened, so he came back and crawled down the cliff into the cave and found some jars about three feet high. This is a model of one. And uh, he looked inside and found inside some ancient scrolls. They were, in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, it was a great discovery. And among many fragments of the Old Testament was one complete copy of the book of Isaiah. And they were just translating the Revised Standard Version of the Isaiah at that very time. And they said, halt the translation. We have found a new copy. And the significance was that this was a copy a thousand years older than the earliest manuscript they already had. The very oldest copy of Isaiah was 900, B, 900 AD, but this was 100 BC. And it took our knowledge of Isaiah a thousand years nearer to the original. So they said, oh, we'll have to alter everything, so hold it. And in fact, they had to make very few alterations to their translation. It had been preserved so well and so carefully over a thousand years. Last year was the 250th anniversary of Handel's Messiah, as I'm sure you knew, because it was played so often on radio and TV. As you probably know, it was a clergyman who wrote the words for Handel's Messiah, or the lyrics as you're supposed to call them now, and he gave these words to Handel and said, set music to them. 24 days later, Handel came back with all the music, and the clergyman was absolutely disgusted and said, you can't possibly have written any good music in that short time, and he hardly spoke to Handel again. But in fact, Handel was really inspired, and you know the result. And an awful lot of the lyrics come straight out of Isaiah. Once again, Isaiah is brought to the public attention. 
Now the chapter headings in the Bible are not inspired and in fact I wish we had a Bible without chapter and verse numbers, we'd really know the Bible and for at least 1100 years the Christian church had Bibles without any chapter and verse numbers in. They had to learn it by context. But whoever divided Isaiah into chapters did a rather interesting thing. I don't even if, know if they were conscious of what they were doing. They divided it into 66 chapters and the Bible has 66 books. Furthermore, they divided Isaiah into two distinct halves, 39 chapters and 27 chapters. And it just happens that the Old Testament has 39 chapters and the New Testament has 27 books rather. Furthermore, the message of the first 39 chapters summarises the message of the Old Testament and the message of the second part, the 27 chapters, 40 to 66, summarises exactly the message of the New Testament. It begins with the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, John the Baptist. It moves on to a servant of the Lord who is anointed by the Holy Spirit who dies for the sins of his people and is raised and exalted after his death. It moves on to, you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And it finishes up with God saying, I am making all things new. I create a new heaven and a new earth. And it finishes up with another place where the fire never goes out and the worms never die. In other words, if somebody took the whole Bible and went mm, and squeezed it into one book, you'd finish up with the prophet Isaiah. It's the Bible in miniature. So if you want to know your Bible, your whole Bible, just read Isaiah and you've got the whole thing condensed. Isn't that remarkable? Even more remarkable, and I'm sure they didn't realise what they were doing, chapters 40 to 66, which are equivalent to the New Testament, by subject matter divide very clearly into three sections, each of nine chapters. And the 40 to 48, the theme is comforting God's people. 49 to 57, the theme is this servant of the Lord who dies and rises again and 58 to 66 are about future glory. Furthermore, in each of those sections of nine chapters, by subject matter they each clearly divide into three sections of three chapters. So the 27 chapters divide into three lots of nine and each lot of nine divides into three lots of three. If you take the middle three, there are three very clear sections in that, 49 to 51, 52 to 54 and 55 to 57. But take the middle section and that clearly divides into three subjects, chapters 52, 53 and 54. It's just one verse out there, the chapter heading got slightly wrong there. And if you take the middle verse of the middle chapter of the middle section of that middle section of the New Testament part of Isaiah, you come to the verse, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. What a remarkable focusing in. Can you move it for me to the uh, next slide? It is not responding. Okay, stop here. All right, now that's just a bonus, all right, uh, for free. Uh, just something interesting. And if you're interested to really look at the book of Isaiah, there are going to be very, very many wonderful truths that you will see in it, both relating to the Old Testament and relating to the New Covenant, all right, to the New Testament. But let's put that aside. My message this morning is to come to the land of the majestic king, Isaiah 33 verses 17 to 24. And let's look at the scripture verse says, Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. 
All right? So let's look at this first section of Isaiah chapter 33, and we just want to see what the Lord will speak to us out of the first part. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. What is Isaiah speaking about when prophetically he spoke to the, in the, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the time of judgment? That he was speaking judgment over Judah and Israel. And then he jumps forward to the future. And he says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Now, you need to know that Isaiah first saw the Lord in chapter 6 when Uzziah died. He saw the Lord sitting on the throne. So we want to talk about seeing the king and what it means to see the king, yeah? seeing the king in his beauty. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And I, and you know, as we begin to look at this part about seeing the king, I want us to know that before we can see the king in the days to come when he comes back, we need to first see, encounter the Lord as Isaiah did, seeing the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the uh, filled, and his robe filled the temple and I didn't put the remaining part of it and the, there was this uh, seraphim uh, that was crying holy, holy, holy and when he cried out holy, holy, holy you know and then Isaiah when he saw the, the holiness of the Lord the first thing he says is woe, woe to me for I have an unclean lips and, uh, 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 and that was his response so the first thing when we encounter the Lord, is to see the holiness of God. And Isaiah saw that. Before you can see the king in his beauty, we have to see the king first today on earth as a holy king. And so this is what he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So the first thing that's needed if we are going to see the king in the future is repentance today. But interestingly, uh, the scripture could have said, oh, I'm a sinful man, I've done many evil things. Why is there a focus on an unclean lips? Because often the things we say reflect the depth of our heart. And there's a lot of wickedness and uh, enduring uh, Isaiah's time of the people, their speech, their lies, the things they say that does not match up with what they really, uh, what they really uh, uh, are in their heart, the, uh, the deception kind of thing. And Isaiah says, woe is me, I am undone. And you know what the Lord did for him? Before the Lord called him and commissioned him, the Lord an angel came and took a burning coal and put it on his lips and burned his lips so that he was made holy. So we need to see that repentance is the first thing. Second thing about seeing the king as we jump to the uh, New Testament is this familiar verse that we have read before. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Through repentance, we become the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, for we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. You know, when the Lord returns, we will see Him in the beauty of His holiness. We'll see the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. So you will see the king in his beauty. That's what Isaiah was telling the people of Israel who was about ready to be judged by the Assyrians and later by Babylon because they had uh, turned to idolatry and rejected God. And, and there was judgment pronounced on them, but the Lord says, but Isaiah says, you will see the king. There will come one day, you will see the king. And of course, it only can come through repentance and, and coming into that uh, kingdom that God has for each one of us. Now, the second thing in this verse, it says is that they will see the land that is very far off. So, we're talking about seeing. Now, if we can see with our spiritual eye the beauty of the holiness of the Lord, the next thing it says, they will see the land that is very far off. And here, Isaiah has many prophecies about the land of the future. Let's just, just look at that. The day of the millennium, the day when the king comes and we'll see him as he comes in all his beauty and we will be holy like him. In that day, how will it be like? And let's focus on that and make it 
part of our life. And one of the first things is in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 says, In that day, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's speaking about Zion, Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. In the day of when we see the land that's afar off, that land, the millennium period of time, every nation that's still alive will flow into it, and God's house will be above every other hill, every other uh, mountain. So, and the, and the verse continues to say, as we see the land, we're called to see the king and see the land. Second, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. And many people shall say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that day will be when people will come into Jerusalem, you know, uh, as the center of the Millennium Kingdom, and they will ask that the Lord, through his house, Mount Zion, the Lord will teach them and the law will go forth. Another thing we are told to look, uh, to look at when we see the land that is far off, is uh, Isaiah continued to say in chapter 2 verse 4, in that day, he shall judge the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Do you know the second part of this verse where they say they shall beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, nations shall not lift up sword against nation? It's in the United Nation that they put this verse here. But the only problem is that they put this part, they didn't put the first part, that he shall judge between the nations. United Nations was supposed to have been set up to bring peace to this world. And, uh, but they have left out God. They have left out the Lord. They left out the verse where he says, he shall judge the nation. You see, there's not going to be any peace on earth if it is not Jesus that's going to be the judge, the lawgiver, and the king. And when he comes in his millennium and he rules over the whole earth, then will there be peace and there will be no more war and they will not teach war anymore. So Isaiah chapter 2 helps us look into the land that's ahead of us. There is coming a day, all right, when every nation will be assembling and going into uh, Mount Zion, into the, into the dwelling place of God to hear his word. And then there will be, uh, and there will no longer be any war, no longer be any uh, fighting and everything that is weapons of war will be turned in to plow shares. In other words, for agriculture, not for war. That's a very bold prophetic word of Isaiah. Why do you and I need believe in Isaiah? Because in Isaiah chapter 40 onwards, the second part, he predicts, he prophesies so accurately about Jesus. Isaiah 53, about Jesus being crucified or dying for his people. Now, and that we see the fulfillment of it. If, if that prophecy is true, why not this prophecy? That when Christ comes back the second time, he will bring forth a kingdom. Now that we see it from afar off, he will bring back, he will bring a kingdom where he will rule over the earth and we, the saints of Jesus Christ, will rule together with him. Now Isaiah chapter 4 has more to say about this millennial kingdom, about this land. Eh? He says, in that day, the Lord will provide shade for Mount Zion and all who assemble there. He will provide a canopy of cloud during the day and smoke and flaming fire at night, covering the glorious land. It will be a shelter from daytime heat and a hiding place from storms and rain. The Lord is our hiding place. In that day, the Lord is our covering. The Lord is our protection. So today, we go through crisis, we go through shaking, but we must see ahead into the land that's coming where all these things are going to be over and God's going to put this a shade of covering for those of us, for us who are in Mount Zion and for those who assembled there. There will be a shelter from the daytime heat telling us from the, uh, and from the climate, from every 
whatever uh, things that the world can throw at us through the climate, He will shelter us from it. All right? Some more. One more. More things about this millennial. Have you ever thought about this first? Huh? You know what the scripture says? During that day, 1,000 years, huh, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like ox. Can you imagine a world where there's no more harm and injury of violence, of bloodshed? That's the land that's far off. We don't see it now. Today, we don't only see animals devouring animals. We see human beings killing human beings. But God is saying, in that land that's going to come. So let us look ahead and have the faith that whatever comes through now, we're going to go through this and be in that land. And that land there, there will be no harm. One more, the verse continues and say, the infant, that's the baby, will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow! May God lift our eyes up to see the beautiful day, that land that's afar, that we will see the king in his beauty and we will see the land that is afar off even now. In faith, we see that day when there's no more violence, no more wars, no more, no more anger, no more harm in the, in the kingdom of God. And chapter 11, verse 10, ends, uh, Isaiah ends with saying, In that day, uh, there shall be a root of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. The root of Jesse is the descendant, is David. So the son of God, the Messiah, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It's going to be a glorious, glorious day when we see the Lord, the King in his beauty, and we see the land that is afar off. So that's the verse we have covered in the first part. Your eyes will see the King in his beauty, and they will see the land that is very far off. And that is just a picture of that which I want you to grasp and hold deep in your heart. And then the next thing is this, your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the, tow uh, who counts the towels? Your eyes will see the King in his beauty. Okay, all right, uh, before we get there. When it says your heart will meditate on terror, it's not saying that you're meditating on, uh, on, on fear something. You're meditating on the absence of terror. You're asking, what has happened to all those who terrorize us? I put for you the translation, sorry, uh, the translation from New Living Translation. Uh, when you say, he says, you will think back to this time of terrors asking, where are the Assyrian officers who counted our towers? Where are the bookkeepers who recorded the plunder taken from our fallen city? You see? So, and then he continues to see, say, you will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. Israel, Judah was going to face the enemy from Assyria and from Babylon and Isaiah was prophesying about that time. And he's saying, in that day, when you see the king in his beauty, and you see that land, you won't see any more the strange people. The Assyrian who speaks in a strange tongue, you cannot understand, all right? You won't see them anymore. You won't see them because God would have taken them out of the way. So what it tells us is that there's coming a day when everything that threatens us, fearsome things that threaten us will be removed from the land. And all we will see have is going to be the beauty of the Lord and the land that is prepared for us. Now, the next part of it is to look upon Zion. And let's learn and see what it says here. Isaiah 33 verse 20 says, look upon Zion. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Let me, I've underlined this two part, and I want you to deal with this Zion, 
for a little while. Now, a lot of us get mixed up with Zion, and it gets a bit confusing when we read the word Zion in the Bible because there are certain meanings to it, all right? But I want to give you some definition from uh, the, the concordance and from uh, the uh, Bible dictionary, yeah? The word Zion, the ancient Hebrew word Zion, Zion, is actually a physical place, a Canaanite hill fortress in Jerusalem, captured by David and called in the Bible the city of David. Today, if you go to Israel, you still have the city of David as a small part, and then you have the rest of Jerusalem which develop and become the dwelling place, all right? So the original Zion is a Canaanite hill fortress in Jerusalem where David conquered and made it his own city. And Zion also means in the Bible, mountain, all right? Another term for governments, all right, or nations. And often the biblical writers would uh, refer to the mountain of the Lord. When you read about the mountain of the Lord, he's speaking about Zion, all right, the city of uh, David, all right? And uh, so we can say that Mount Zion represents the kingdom of God, where in Revelation 21, and it looks ahead to the new Jerusalem that will descend out of heaven. So when you read the word Mount Zion, especially in the New Testament, you're referring to the kingdom of God, spoken specifically in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem that will descend out of heaven. So Zion can refer to three places as you read in the Bible. Number one, the hill where the most ancient areas of Jerusalem stood. Number two, it can also refer to the city of Z Jerusalem itself. Number three, as in the kingdom of God, as the dwelling place of God. All right? With that little understanding about Zion, I will bring to your memory the last slide uh, I did uh, uh, two Sundays ago, uh, where Hebrews, the scripture says, you have come to Mount Zion. All right? You come to a dwelling place of God, to the kingdom of God. Huh? You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant that speaks better things than that of Abel. So we're coming to the new covenant, the grace of God, the dwelling place of God. You could say on earth, the church of Jesus Christ, but that is the universal church of Jesus Christ as well. So these are the references to Mount Zion. So when we look at Mount the first just now, you will look upon Zion, and it says the city of our appointed feast. What does it mean, the city of our appointed feast? All right? What is the city of our appointed feast, all right? So let's look at these three feasts that is commonly, uh, that marks out Jerusalem uh, and Mount Zion. In Israel, there are at least seven feasts, but there are three major feasts, okay, which, was for, which uh, the people of Israel have to travel to to celebrate. And these feasts have been fulfilled, two of these feasts have been fulfilled in the New Testament. All right? The Feast of the Passover, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. All right? So that was the time when Moses brought them out of Egypt. And uh, they had to have this Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. They have to slaughter the Passover lamb to put the blood over the, uh, uh, the doors, the lintels of the doorways. And we see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus was the Passover lamb. So Jesus died on the cross as a fulfillment of the first feast in the church. So it is the feast of the Passover. And 50 days, for seven weeks uh, after the feast of the power, uh, Passover, on the 50th day is the feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. Now, do you know that when the children of Israel celebrated the Passover the first time, when they journeyed through the wilderness, they stood at Mount Sinai, and when the law was given, it was given on this day. That's why they celebrate Pentecost. To them in the Old Testament, the celebration of Pentecost was a celebration of God giving them the law. So it was very significant that in the New Covenant, after Jesus died and rose again, on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his spirit where instead of the law of God written on tablets that was broken 
now the Spirit of God poured out writes the laws of God in our hearts. That's why Hebrews say, we have not come to Mount Sinai. We have come to Mount Zion, the day of Pentecost where God's words are written on our heart. But there's one more feast, the Feast of Booths or Sukkoth or the Feast of Tabernacles. When is that going to be fulfilled? All right. Interestingly, there is this prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14 verse. The whole chapter of chapter 14 is about the day of the Lord when Jesus comes and his and he stands on Mount of Olives, there's going to be a major earthquake, and then the mountain will move from northward and southward, and it will split east and west, and then there will be a river that flows out from the east and goes down to the Dead Sea, and the river that flows out and goes to the East Sea, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea, and he says, on that day, it shall come to pass, on that day, after Jesus had defeated the nation, it shall come to pass that everyone who's left all the nations which came against Jerusalem during the end times shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of the Tabernacles. So, the Millennial Kingdom, the land that's are far off that we have been talking about, that we want to see, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. Once Jesus returned to earth as King, He will rule and reign. Uh, uh, his kingdom from Jerusalem and the saints will rule with him and that period of time the Feast of Tabernacles will play a prominent role as the survivors of the nations will be required to present themselves before the Lord each year to celebrate the Feast of the Booths these are all in the scripture in Isaiah right so in other words there's going to be a fulfillment of that final feast not yet but when Christ comes Passover fulfilled in Christ, Pentecost fulfilled through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, Tabernacles going to be fulfilled when Christ comes back and we're in the Millennial Kingdom. So your eyes will see Zion. Look upon Zion and the city of the appointed feast. And then the next thing he says is, your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet town, home. A tabernacle that not, will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will be ever removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. So here's a picture of Jerusalem as a tabernacle. All right? Tabernacle, the people, the house of God, the dwelling place of God is a tabernacle. And I want to just show you another verse in Isaiah that speaks about this tabernacle and what the Lord says during the day before his kingdom comes. He says, Sing, O barren. You who have not born, break into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Then he says this, enlarge your tent. You see, Jerusalem will be a tabernacle that will not be taken down, all right? That's towards the end. But now he's speaking to Zion, speaking to the people of God. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. This prophetic word speaks about us in the church today because the nations will be reached through Jesus Christ and there will be an expansion and an enlargement of the covering of Jerusalem, of the kingdom of God, and uh, we will, every nation will be represented and then desolate cities will be made inhabited. Now, look upon Zion. Let's look at this phrase, huh? A, a tab Jerusalem, a tabernacle that will not be taken down, not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. And I'm going to spend the remaining of time very quickly on this. I believe that as a people of God, I've just noted down at the bottom here, salt shakers, a disciple-making movement. We want to be a network of connect groups. And when the scripture says, enlarge your tent, He's not saying to us to uh, build bigger buildings. He's saying to extend the, the reach of the church far and wide into our city. 
And uh, I believe God has given us this strategy that we should start planting connect groups throughout our city. And He says, don't hold back. Lengthen your cord. Go as far as you can. Strengthen the stakes. This disciple-making movement is going to involve every one of us. By now, you would have known, right, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, that your, the church has made a major decision. Our major decision is to stop renting South Shakers Ministry uh, Centre for various reasons, and uh, one of which, of course, is uh, to uh, save the cost that's involved in paying rental. It's because we are not sure we're going to be using the place uh, at all in the pandemic, and so it's pointless paying money for uh, good money, and then we can only use for recording and kind of things, and not much use of it, because the church is not the building. And so we have decided to release this building and uh, to go back to really focus on being a network, because that's when this prophecy can, fulfill, can be fulfilled. We're going to see fruitfulness. We're going to see the, the courts being uh, lengthened. That means we're going to see new groups planted throughout, whether it's in Bayan Baru or over the mainland. We're going to strengthen the stakes. We're going to plant the connect groups into every area, and we're going to let it go forth and cover as far as we can by the grace of God. Now, when I say this, probably many of us are going to say in our hearts, Wow, there's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be very difficult. We don't know how to multiply. We don't know what to do. But I want to encourage you, the remaining portions of Scripture, when it talks about this land, looking upon Zion, kind of thing, speaks about how it will be in that land. And it will be not by might, no, not by power. If you think, if we think that by our brilliance, by our money, by our numbers, we're going to expand and uh, influence the nation, then we are sadly mistaken because that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says in that day, there the majestic Lord, the beautiful Lord, the majestic Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galleys with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by. In the context of the Assyrian and Babylon, uh, what the scripture was saying that you will no longer see all these big boats and uh, galleys and all those uh, majestic ships sailing and, uh, and, and, and conquering you. But he says the Lord himself, and like we said last week, the Lord is the river whose streams will make the city glad. In that river... You know what the Lord is saying? He says here, the Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail. What do we understand with galley with oars? Galley with oars are those kind of long boats where the, the, the sailors and the warriors in it sail it by using oars. All right? So there's a lot of energy, a lot of energy in, uh, uh, in moving the galleys ahead. So it's full of the energy of human effort. And I believe the Lord's saying to us, to see Jerusalem as a tabernacle that will not be torn down, and whose stakes will not be removed, and whose cords will not be broken, and from Isaiah 54, where we are told to extend the cords, uh, lengthen the cords, strengthen uh, the stakes, and uh, and extend the tent, all right? That we are speaking about an effort that's not going to be human. It's not going to be because we roar, or, or, or roar our all. It's not because we're going to work so hard with our flesh, all right? So in that river of God, it is not by might nor power. In the river of God, it is going to be by the grace of God. So, we're going to see expansion. Uh, so, we should not worry when we say, Lord, we want to follow your will and extend our connect group. We should not worry about how we're going to do that, Father. We don't know what to do. All we need to be concerned about is that we need to seek the face of the Lord and come into the grace of the Spirit. That's why prayer meetings are going to be very important, where we're going to pray through these things. Lord, no galleys with all will row in that place. Okay? No, it's not going to be by the strength of human effort. 
It's going to be by the might of God. The Lord Himself will be the broad river and the, will bring joy to us. And, and in that river of the Holy Spirit, no self-effort. Everything is the grace of God. What's the second thing? No majestic ships pass by. Basically, what it means is that there's no pride. Majestic ships are those ships that are large and big. And it speaks about, it speaks about arrogance. It speaks about uh, when kings have huge ships, they, have, uh, they hope to threaten and uh, frighten the other nations. But the Lord says, in this river, it's nothing to do with human strength. It's nothing to do with human pride. It's all going to be by my might, by my spirit. Because the river of the Lord is the Spirit of God. And in that day, uh, the Lord is our judge and the Lord is our God, our uh, uh, lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And the last verse, the last verse, and we shall finish. This speaks about your tackle. I mean, the thing that holds the, uh, the sail uh, is loose. They could not strengthen their mass. They could not spread the sail. Then the prey of great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey and the inhabitant will say will not say i'm sick and the people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity what happens is that it's not going to be how strong we can to strengthen our mass or tighten the tackle or spread the sail but when the lord is at work okay the prey the great plunder ahead of us the harvest ahead of us will be taken and divided and the lame will take the prey. In other words, those who are not necessary, the strong, but the weak and the, uh, the foolish things like Paul says in Corinthians, the foolish things of God. God has chosen to use the foolish things of God. And in that day, in that land, the land that we're supposed to look at, the Zion, you see, no one will say, I'm sick. The grace of God that flows through will bring healing. The river that flows through will bring healing. And today, as we move towards the glorious day, we are moving closer and closer. The church should become more and more like the land is far off. The church should become to see more and more of the grace of God and not human strength. More and more of the harvest that comes, not because we try to work so hard for it. The plunder is divided uh, amongst, uh, amongst us. Like later on, when you read Isaiah 53, the Bible uh, uh, talks about Jesus dividing the, the plunder with, with the people. And so, it will be a day in which more and more increasingly, we will see people being healed, health in the church of Jesus Christ. Because if we're approaching that day of the far off land, the church needs to press on into that being like that. And because the people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquities. So may God cause us to look with our spiritual eyes what it shall be in the day when Christ comes back. And from today, let's try to make our church like that. We see the vision of the land far off. We see the vision of the king. So we will purify ourselves, right? Because the scripture says when we see the beauty of the king and his holiness, we know that we want to be like him. When we see the land and what's going to be, we want to be like that today. And we know that it's the Lord himself, the river of the living, uh, living uh, the li uh, rivers of life will flow through us. And it will be not because we are clever, we're smart, we've got energy, we're, we have money, but it will be solely by the power of God. And if it's solely by the power of God, let's remind ourselves, the power of God comes upon a praying church. Let's learn how to pray and allow the Spirit of God to just move afresh in our life. And I want to conclude this. Today is a a little bit longer than last week, but I want to conclude this by encouraging brothers and sisters. New things happening ahead of us, right? 2021, we're going to focus on discipleship groups. If you're not in a connect group, get into one now. Be 
part of that small group which is going to be an army of God. It's going to be a family where you're going to be taken care of. It's going to be an army where we're going to reach out to the lost. And together we can seek the face of the Lord and say, Lord, teach us, Lord. Teach us how we can flow in that river. Not by our gaddies with oars or mighty ship. Not by strength of human effort. Not by pride. But solely by the grace of God. So that the prey of great plunder will be divided and we the lame will take the prey the lame will take the prey those who are weak before the lord will see the strength of the lord in us so may god cause us to move in the direction so join the connect group be quick to do so and then let's look forward to the grace of god to bring us into an expansion where we will enlarge our tent, okay? And we will lengthen our courts and strengthen our stakes. And we say connect groups, not only in Tanjung Bunga, Tanjung Tokong area, or in town area, but it will extend to the other parts of, uh, uh, of Penang Island, as well as to the mainland. And is it going to be done by us? No, but by the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray for an anointing upon the church to do the work of god lord not because of who we are of what we have but because of the grace of god father we want to come fully again into what, knowing and understanding what it is to lean totally on the grace of god and to see our church grow and influence many for the kingdom of god and i pray that lord you convict every one of our hearts to see the king to see the land, to enjoy and see uh, Jerusalem and to uh, not know this, not by might nor by power. To look upon Zion, not by might, not by power, but by thy spirit, O Lord. Bless your people this week as we uh, engage in the things you call us to and bring the church to pray on prayer meeting uh, on Wednesday night. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.